Okay, everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for June 27th, 2012. Uh, I'm Matt Gradwall of Uppercut Woodworks at uh, uppercutwoodworks.com. You can find me at Twitter at uppercutwood. Um, and if you go to Uppercut Woodworks, you can find um, the Wood Chat menu, um, which will give you links to Wood Chat on YouTube and on Google Plus, uh, all the transcripts the ch and the chat room, and uh, the poll for topics for Wood Chat. With us tonight, we have uh, Andy. Andy, I want you to introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Andy Brownell. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Alan Warb, uh, A L L E N W O R B. Um, my uh, blog is brownellfurniture.com, and uh, this is my second wood chat. Cool. And then tonight we also have Vic Hubbard with us. Vic? Yeah, hi, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm Vic Hubbard uh, with uh, Tumble Woodworks, uh, and my uh, uh, blog is www.tumblewood.blogspot.com and I am at Tumblewood on Twitter. On the Twitter. On to the Twitter. Yeah. Cool. Um, so uh, Chris Wong is usually with us. Uh, he'll be showing up late. He's at work. Um, he's he uh, at Chris Blair. What's that? He was sitting on the dock by the bay. Sitting on the dock by the bay doors. Um, he'll be joining us later when he gets off work. He is at, um, at Chris Has Flair um, or at flairwoodworks.com. Um, just a couple reminders. We're going to cancel next week. That's July 4th. It's Independence Day here in the States. Um, and a big holiday for everybody. I'll be out of town, um, so we're not going to have a wood chat on July 4th, but we'll be back on July 11th. And we'll be talking with Andy um, about uh, more Gorilla Glue stuff. And we might have some um, other guests that join us. Um, so tonight's topic is uh, mistakes you've made during your woodworking and ways to either repair those mistakes um, or to de design around them. So um, Andy had a topic. So Andy, why don't we get you started? And I'm going to try and fix the, um, while you do that, I'm going to be typing, so I'll probably mute. I've got to fix the video broadcast on the chat page. So, so go ahead. All right. Well, I um, I had uh, I've been you know dealing with dealing with some challenges on my uh, my Rubo bench project. It's been uh, a little bit more of a, a a challenge than I thought in a few areas. Um, I've had a few tweaks that I've had to make along the way based on materials, but the one that I was dealing with this weekend actually um, was. Um, Contending with my uh, tail vise installation, I use the template that was most recently updated by Jamil. He's usually really good about updating all that kind of stuff um, on his site, on his blog, and um, I marked off the the holes where the the tail vise needed to attach to it. Drilled the holes. Um, everything looked fine. Um, so then followed the instructions further, and I attached the end vise and did the condor tails and everything, got everything glued up and aligned everything, thought it was right, and uh, when everything kind of went into place, I was off by probably about three-eighths of an inch. I, um, I posted a link, uh, I'm posting it right now actually, to the tweet chat for everyone else to see. Um, basically, it's uh, it just required a lot of, you know, adjustments in both the um, guide rail positions underneath the bench, and then the um, the hole itself, I had to kind of file down a little bit so it would align properly with the uh, Acme screw um, block, I guess that um, that that holds the the tail vise kind of in place in alignment. So what ended up happening, and there's a picture um, on my um, on my post most recently that basically shows that the Acme screw, you know how there's like a slot where everything kind of slides back and forth, the sliding dog uh, hole basically is? The Acme screw just kind of protrudes a little bit in, so I don't have quite an inch and three quarters to throw stuff in there on, but uh, you know, otherwise I think my only other option was completely, you know, starting from scratch on the end block to get it, you know, aligned properly, and that just 
wasn't an option for me. So it's far from perfect, but I still think it's going to be a, an improvement over what I have right now, which is just a crappy old Silberg bench, I guess. And this was a, uh, which vice was this? Uh, this is the tail vice. Okay. Hey, actually, I, I uh, um, had mine here, so uh, my bench is a mess, but I'll, so if you can kind of go over what you were talking about there. Okay. So let's see here. Make sure I'm pointing at the right thing. So this is you were talking about this the tail vice, right? Yeah. So, so at here. the end there, where you align. No, uh, go back down where you align the holes and everything. Yeah. Um, with the where the template would go. Mm -hmm. I I marked it off exactly as the holes were were shown in the template. I taped it down like Jamil said, pan up a little bit. Okay. There you go. Um, and then I drilled the holes. You know everything worked fine when I did a dry fit. Then I, you know, attached the tail block, screwed everything in, um, you know, glued the rails on, and then on the underside, um, you know, I cut the recesses for the, the glide. So you see how your acne screw right there yeah. does not protrude into that piece, basically? Right. It doesn't protrude into that, that slot where the That's opening right is. Right here? Uh, no, pan up. Okay, so yeah, you've got full clearance there. Right now, because of the way I had to adjust it, everything had to basically shift to the left by about a quarter of an inch in oh, order okay. to get it to align with the hole that I had already drilled and attached the end cap with. So it's... You know, it, it works fine now, um, but it's got that gap. And the only other choice I think I had was to basically take the, you know, take the end cap off and, and, and replace the whole thing and redrill and readjust so that things were aligned. So it's kind of a bummer, but, uh, you know, what am I going to do at this point? It's a workbench. Yeah, I, I had something similar happen. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was the tapping of the holes, I thought, Vic. Right. It was when I was tapping holes on the, um, the leg vise, and I, um, I put them in the wrong area. Um, oh, really? I, uh, uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's PC, uh, it's PC wood glue. Basically, it's, it's a, it's a two-part epoxy, uh, you know, so you just... You know, cut off what you need and, and uh, shove it in the holes and re-drill. Uh, PC wood epoxy? This is a PC lumber. Uh, it's a wood, wood epoxy. Uh, you, uh, I think JB Weld makes something similar to it. It's just a two-part epoxy that, uh, and it drills just like wood. Um, so that's, that's, what, that's how I ended up uh, um, dealing with the fact I, I yeah I used too big of a uh, tap so I, uh, I drilled I drilled it and then I just reamed it out really bad with too big of a tap so uh, um, so I had to yeah redo that but and that's of course not the only mistake I made on my bench but <laughs> the only one that was uh, similar to yours <laughs> yeah you know I I, I wasn't uh, the the other the the leg glide went in fine I had no issues with that. Um, it just was this misalignment. I know a couple of people have dealt with it, but they said it was only off by like a 64th of an inch. And the only other thing I could think of, and Matt, maybe you may have some insights into this, is that maybe like my printer settings changed the proportion yes. or size was of the this PDF. A PDF. Yeah. Okay, so this is a common problem when printing PDFs and you want actual scale. There's a print option in PDFs where it'll try and shrink the, shrink to fit. the thing that you want. Yeah, it'll shrink to fit because each printer has a printable, a non-printable area right. where, the, where the printer actually can't print up to the top or to the edge. And so uh, Acrobat tries to query that information from the print driver yeah. and then take the printable page and shrink it in there. Son of a gun. So it's, it's, many times it's best to check that option or to print at like uh, like a FedEx Kinkos or at like a UPS store. Yeah. And and put in your job. Print this full size actual 
you know, one inch equals one inch. Yeah. And I, I had a guy send me a uh, PDF of a CAD output that he did for some really nice um, Adirondack chairs. And what I yeah, liked yeah. about them is that they had incorporated curves. You know, Adirondack chairs have that um, really long leg. Right. Right. Sorry, I'm going to put myself on the screen here. They have, Adirondack chairs have that really long straight leg that often goes out too far in the back that just becomes, takes up too much space, it becomes something that people trip on. So his, his curved down, which I really liked. And um, I had FedEx Kinko's print that on their gigantic printer, just full size. And then what I did was I um, sprayed it on the back with like Super 90 or contact cement spray. Yeah. And put it right down on a piece of 3 uh like Baltic birch. Yeah, I don't like to use the um, hard carbon paper stuff for router templates. The hardboard that's got the fuzzy pressed underside. Yeah, and then I um, cut out my full size templates. I use my rigid sander, and I've got great templates now. And I didn't even bother taking off the paper. It's like why bother? It's it's not the real part. It's the template, right? Yeah, it had the markings for the holes and stuff. You know, I was thinking that the position of that stuff could just as easily on the template be shown, you know, as measurements from, like, the top and the left-hand side and just, yeah. you know, indicate... Yeah, your two reference it. edges, here's what you want to do. Yeah. Well, I know I'm not alone in dealing with some of those issues, but, you know, again, it's, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm still... I'm still excited at, at having having the project complete. Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Boas has the joined us. Wonderful. Out. So, uh, Rob, you want to introduce yourself real quick on video? Sure. My name is Rob, and uh, I'm a woodworker. And how can people find you on Twitter or uh, on the blogosphere? Sure. Uh, so on Twitter, I'm the Voice Shop. And on the blogosphere, it's theboyshop.com. And boys is spelled B-O-I-S for all of the all of Correct. you who haven't exposed to to Rob. Hey, so Rob, our topic today is mistakes you've made um, and how you've fixed them or worked around them with design changes. So um, we're just talking to Andy about a benchcraft advice install where uh, printer scaling option for PDF kind of screwed up his template. Um, uh, Andy, how did you fix that? Did you did you just? I, I shifted everything. Well, I mean, it's 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 not perfectly fixed, but it's adjusted to work. So I shifted everything over to the left, which now causes the acne screw to protrude a little bit into that slot. I had right. to make a, a slight adjustment on the the little traveling uh, bench dog slot. I had to kind of cut about a kerf width off. Um, and then I just took a a, a rasp and kind of filed the uh, the hole down a little bit more. You know, it still it still had enough space in it where that that extra spot for the washer sits. So I was still able to get it to sit squarely. I had to kind of drop that down a little as well. But it's you know it seems to be working fine. You give it the spin and it runs all the way. So okay. So instead of trying to patch that and redo it, you just decided to move the vise. Yeah, I mean, I would have literally had to cut the, the front lamination off, all the dovetail work, remove the, the end cap, put a floating tenon. I mean, it would have been a nightmare. It just would have been an absolute nightmare. Not fun. And three-eighths of an inch probably isn't too big of a deal. You can work around that. Yeah, I mean, and plus, at the, you know, I, I can still get the full width of something through that sliding dog block for about four inches before it actually starts to interfere with the um, with the actual acne screw, so there's still space if I want to use the vise that way. And then if I need something bigger, I've got my I've got the Moxon vise that that I can use as well. Yeah, so okay. now you made a comment earlier. You said a crappy Schoberg's bench. So you don't like your Schoberg's bench? No, it's horrible. It racks and just doesn't hold any kind of. Is it the smaller one? What's that? Is it the smaller one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's my first bench. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and put your uh, your picture here in the video stream. Was it a picture? Okay. Or a from the from the most recent post? Yeah, the dealing with mistakes on the Rubo bench. I'm going to zoom in and show that real quick. 
just so that we make sure we get it into the um, into the video stream. Cool. And as I show this, maybe you can. So it looks like. Up yeah. So. Here, yeah, you can see you can see thing you know the the acme screw just protruding a tiny bit there. Right here. Yeah. And then the image below it is basically the space you know see that little strip right there to the right of the. Uh, right here. Yeah, that's pretty much the piece that I had to kind. Of, that's the distance I had to shift things to align with the hole. Okay. Um, that's a top looking down view of kind of the the traveling uh, bench dog hole. Right. And if you just look at that little black edge right before it gets to the hole itself, right here, that's that's the bottom edge of the metal plate, which I think I'm just going to take to like a local machinist and just have them, you know, shave off an eighth of an inch so that I don't have to deal with like a smaller bench dog now. How how thick is that? The steel? Yeah. <laughs> I I think it's like quarter inch steel. Okay, so a file might be a little. I don't know if I. I mean, I would be filing that down forever. Yeah, it's a quarter inch. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna. I, I know a guy that's got like a, a a plasma cutter or something that I can. Okay. Have him do it for free. And then these are the condor tails that you did not want to have to bust apart. No, they came out perfectly. I used that, uh, or almost perfectly. I mean, I used the the article that uh, Jamil had in Popular Woodworking a while ago. Yeah. And it it works amazingly well when you're hogging out that much waste and you use the little bearing template and everything, it's it's pretty cool. I mean I had no adjusting, no filing and no paring down. It just it did exactly what I needed to do. Very cool. Yeah. I, I recommend if, if anyone's considering building this bench to, to follow those instructions. It's it's just a flawless way of getting those things to work. So Andy, are you a member of the Guild uh, Wood Whisperer Guild also? Uh, I'm not. Okay, because I was just wondering, because you know this is like the bench that everybody's been building. So yeah, I follow. I followed that, and I knew a lot of people were building it. I I was I wanted to build it a while ago, but I just didn't have the materials or the money. I mean, it's <laughs> this was my most expensive project to date. So <laughs> gotcha. not a cheap project. No, I think what did you mention? Twelve hundred dollars into this, at least. God, I mean, between the hardware and the wood, and then the labor for at the the shop that the, the the big industrial shop to kind of mill everything and flatten things, yeah, probably twelve, thirteen hundred bucks at least. Plus, I had oh, you know what? Probably more because I I had to buy a bunch of clamps too. Yeah, <laughs> those well, are cheap. Come on, come on, clamps. No, I know. <laughs> it's a perfect perfect excuse. So yeah. Benjamin Johnson has a good point. He, um, mentioned in the in the chat room. You might just be able to um, shave off that metal with a, a jigsaw, with a good jigsaw blade, or even a belt sander if it's not that much. But quarter inch, you're gonna want a good, you're gonna want a good blade. Yeah, I saw Vic shaking his head. There's no freaking way that that, thing, <laughs> that metal is gonna get cut down. It's like it's like tool steel. Yeah. Okay. It, yeah. I would imagine Jamil uses good stuff. Um, I, the reason I asked about the workbench is I have the big Seelbergs. Mm -hmm. And I've got it's like nine feet, and it's got uh, I've got um, four banks of drawers underneath it. Oh wow! And they're full, and yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't move. I like it. the the thing I like the least about it is the vice handles are about I don't know eight inches long. Um, and Shannon Rogers, if you're watching, uh, a long time ago we talked about you turning me some cool new vice handles. I'm still kind of waiting, buddy. So. But when I get those, I'll take that in. What's that, Rob? Not cool. I know. I did a $10 PayPal donation to a site the other day, and he goes, what was that for? I said, I'm just trying to get those handles moving, you know? So <laughs> I like my Seobergs. I mean, I, I, I'm i kind of at the point where I don't have enough time to not build stuff that I can't sell. Yeah. You know? Um and when this bench doesn't work for me, I'll build an I'll build one. If I was to build something, I would build a big assembly table. That's the thing I need the most is because right now I'm always working on a piece on my bench. Yeah. While, while the project is on the bench, and so I'm always moving stuff back and forth, and then I put it on my table saw, and then I have to move it to go cut a piece. It's just. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I deal with the same thing. I figure this the, my old bench will just become a new work surface to hold crap. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, question from the chat room. How how heavy do you think that bench is? Mine? Yeah. Uh, it's it's smaller. Um, it's 72 inches long. I, I, I gotta imagine it's gonna the whole thing is gonna be over 200 250 pounds. Okay. It's kind of cantilevered on the right hand side. There's a, a bigger overhang on the right, and then there's only about a four four and a half inch overhang on the left where the leg glide vice is. Right. And that's that was based on two things. One, uh, the wood that I had wasn't straight enough to get long pieces like that. Plus, my workshop is small, Got so it. I actually didn't have wall space or place to put a bench that was the full the full size. Yeah, I think mine's about uh, probably 300 pounds, three to 350 maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but mine's all out of fur. You know, it's 10 feet long. So. 10 feet. Yep. Wow. Did you use those big fur beams? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. Do you, do you see those? That, that's what I made made, made it out of. Oh, you yeah. You want? It looks like you got some extra beams. You could make me one. I've got a lot of beams, dude. Well, go ahead and make me one, then. You could yeah, probably I turn some vice in. Money to me. And, uh, you know, the price of reclaimed lumber actually has gone to the roof, which is, is awesome because I bought all that stuff for like a dollar, dollar fifty a board, uh, a running foot, yeah. not a board foot. Yeah. So, Rob, you, you've had to work around any mistakes, or is everything always just perfect in Massachusetts? Yeah, that's the weird thing. Like, I just don't make mistakes, so it's... it's uh... <laughs> No, actually, in all honesty, I think some of the uh, the coolest design features that I've maybe not the coolest, but some cool design features I've come up with were were not by design at all. I think sometimes in a project you make a mistake, it forces you to think a little bit differently about the project. And I've actually ended up with, believe it or not, a better outcome because I've screwed something up in the past. That's cool. That's cool. Do you have a specific example, like maybe from the stool or the jewelry chest? I did a wine cabinet a number of years back, and um, it's it was all uh, Honduran mahogany. So I spent you know a good amount of money on the the lumber to begin with, and I was I had the whole thing done and glued up and assembled, and I just wanted to chamfer the openings. There were two um, two doors in in the front of the case. And I just wanted to put a little bit of a chamfer around it, and because I was lazy or for whatever reason, I decided a router was the right way to chamfer the inside. Just you know, take take the edge off so that when you reached in, you wouldn't you know skin yourself. Right. So I just put a chamfer bit in a small trim router and neglected to um, actually tighten the collet. So oh. as I started routing, the bit started lowering more and more and taking a bigger chunk out of that. So I ended up with a pretty good sized chamfer before I realized what was going on. And my only recourse was to go in and actually chamfer around the inside edge of the entire door frame on both sides to that thickest um, point. And because I did like an antiqued glazing technique to the finished product, it actually really worked because the, the doors now really stand out in the frames. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like now looking back, I'm looking at a picture of it right now, and I'm thinking like it really wouldn't have looked right had I not had a really deep chamfer. But that was probably the best example where I really screwed something up out of honestly just sheer stupidity, and <laughs> it ended up looking better. That's cool. And no, no safety problems because of that bit slipping? It didn't, I mean, it never came all the way out. By the time, you know, I had tightened it a little bit, enough that it didn't come flying out. Uh, that would have been a pretty pretty big disaster. Yeah. Um, I just noticed that that chamfer kept getting bigger and bigger, and I'm thinking to myself, that's that's probably not right. Yeah, that's it right there. Well, let's put it in the screen share in the video right here. Thanks, Vic, for finding that. Wow, okay, I see what you mean. Uh, you're talking about the, where the, where the frame of the door meets the panel? Um, no, actually, oh. where the frame of the door meets the uh, 
the carcass itself, so the opening for the entire door itself, um, you can see that there's a fairly good chamfer in the frame there. Right. And because, again, I used that, that glazing technique where I had some asphaltum that I was using to glaze it, that settled into the recesses of the door panel. And without having that kind of offset with the, the frame itself, uh, it wouldn't have looked right. Okay. So Are you talking about right here? Can't see your mouse pointer. Um, can you see that uh, I'm I'm uh, um, uh, got it enlarged? No. Oh really? Okay. I see it on your screen in the browser, but that's it. Okay. If you could. If yeah, because uh, I actually had uh, um, had it up. Is uh, um, oh great. And what I do lose it? Oh, there it is. Don't know why that popped out of there. Screen share should be right there. Yeah, there we go. And then if you control scroll, you should be able to zoom. Zoom in right on the door detail there. Or control plus. There you go. Okay, I see what you're talking about. Right, so the so you, you ended up having almost right an there. edge game on those doors which really absorbed the finish. It wasn't even the, that's not even the finish, that's the, the asphaltum. Um, I basically brushed the asphaltum over the sealed material um, and then wiped off the excess. The whole point of that is that it makes it look, it's kind of like what happens to an antique piece of furniture over time. You get kind of yeah. like dirt and grime that settles in the recesses yeah. and not in the higher points. Um, and so that's what that's what you see around the edges of the panel itself. That's just where the asphaltum settled in there. Very cool. So without having that kind of offset with the the opening to the 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 case, it it would have looked odd. You know, it would have looked like a brand new crisp door frame. Yeah. And these really old, um, you know, frame and panel doors with lots of grime recessed in the. Yeah, and it, and it might have been a little flat on the front too. Yeah, yeah, you would have had you wouldn't have had any shadow lines breaking that up. So yeah. it you know, it's one of those things that just just again sheer sheer luck and stupidity actually working in my favor for yeah. a rare occasion. So what about uh working around defects in materials whether it's a knot knots in woods or um was it WIA last year where um Chris Schwartz had that, what do you call it, skunky wood bench, and, and it got broken. But what about kind of repairing defects in materials or working around those? I usually try to work around them. Um, or what about incorporating them? <laughs> or not? Depends on the piece. I mean, for me, um, it's like... Uh, even on on the the timbers for the rubo, so like I I'm so adverse to uh, um, for my own taste to rustic furniture. Yeah. That I tried really hard to bring that a lot of uh, like the Art Deco stuff in to to bring it more into a, uh, a more of a contemporary piece because I'm just I'm not a fan of uh, rustic, you know. But but the thing is, you can still have knots and stuff in. The right piece and and have it be a contemporary piece of furniture. Yeah, uh, depends on where it shows up too. You know, yeah. I mean, I, it, it, wood species in particular, like walnut, is notoriously filled with knots, or it's just a lot harder to get really big clear pieces. So yeah, I've you know I've come up with ways of kind of filling some of those imperfections in a little bit to at least stabilize them, like a lot of people have, and you know I. I had to make a bunch of walnut beds, and I had, you know, some knots to contend with. But yeah, as long as it's not interfering with joinery for me, it's not a big deal. Yeah. I did have, um, on the mantles that I finished that I still haven't blogged about, I did have one mantle that was for their sitting room where they intend to read. And uh, I got really lucky that the lumber yard basically brought down their two big brand-new shipments of walnut and uh, cut the metal bands off them and let me just pick through them and take what I wanted. And I found two pieces, one that basically had two knots that were very symmetrical. It was almost looked like they were book matched. And they kind of curved up on the end, so they looked like owl eyes. 
And then I found another piece that looked, um, it was a knot with two pin knots, so it almost looked like a nose. And so I put the two eyes, I, I cut the piece so that I centered the two eyes in the middle of the front of the sitting room mantle. And then on the bottom piece, below that, I put the nose. And these customers had told me that they, that they wanted to know that this was wood. Um, and we had had a discussions that they didn't want it to be kind of a Kenny Rogers rustic, <laughs> <laughs> but, but they did want to, but they do live in the Northwest. And they didn't want, typically when, when people use wood here, they use a lot of uh, clear vertical grain fir. And uh -huh. they do kind of a, 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 they kind of do a fusion of Pacific Northwest and Asian. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of fancy boutique hotels that do that, but they wanted walnut. And so I took a risk and I put this owl face in there. And when the, when the mom saw this, she lost it. She loved it because her favorite books of her kids when they were growing up was this book about an owl. And so she just thought I was just, you know, the most artistic, design, brilliant guy in the world. And I'm like, no, not really. I just, you know, <laughs> figured it looked like an owl. <laughs> but she was pretty happy with that. So um, so I took a chance there, and I got lucky. I, I didn't, I, there was only three knots in the three mantles that you could see, and those were the three. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, they, and they weren't a defect. I didn't have to worry about them popping out or anything like that. What were they made out of? Walnut. Walnut, yeah. Um, that's that's my favorite wood, and um, they wanted dark, but not. But they don't. They didn't want that dark coffee espresso glaze that's coming on all the foreign furniture. Yeah. And so I brought them a bunch of samples. They were getting stone around their fireplace, and so they really wanted something that would um, not contrast so in a, in a in a shocking way with the stone. But they mm -hmm. didn't want it to just blend and blend in. They wanted these things to have to stand out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And they, they loved the walnut. And I just finished it with um, I sprayed tons of coats of shellac, and then I did um, a top coat of endurovar, and they were they were pretty psyched. So that's cool. You know, the, the walnut is um, you know if, if you get the the kiln dried stuff, it has kind of that purpley look to it. Steamed. Yeah, but if it's air dried, it looks a lot look looks a lot nicer. The only challenge is it just kind of trying to stabilize it to look a little darker for longer because it gets lighter over time. Yeah, I did a uh, I did a mantle fireplace project for myself. Um, I just shot a link to uh, on on the wood chat where I used um, like medium walnut tongue oil or uh, Danish oil rather. Yeah, I've used that. That's pretty good. And it it. it it doesn't really darken it, but it seems like it stabilizes the darker color for a while. Yeah. Hey, uh, Dale is in the chat room, and he just shared something that's pretty cool. I'm going to put it on the screen share here. Um, you know, Matt, I tried to find your uh, your mantles, and they're not on your site. Yeah, I haven't blogged about them yet because I'm a punk. Oh, that's bad. I did nice. not want to screen share that screen share. Now, see, I'm a big fan of uh, the... Uh, the sapwood and walnut, but I, I know uh, um, our, our our friend over here really hates it. Yeah, Mr. I incorporated it into a table and it looked pretty good. Yeah, I saw Hayden's table there. I thought it looked good too. I so think here's uh, here's Dale's wormwood. Um, I think that looks pretty cool, and I also like the fact that he's got glass, metal, and wood in this. I think that looks pretty. I think it almost looks like cork. It does yeah, it look like cork. yeah, it does. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I've actually like changed design elements to work around defects, but I'm so anal retentive that yeah. I won't allow a defect <laughs> in the material in the final piece. Yeah, I think all of us have done that. I, I mean, I, believe me, when I bought that walnut, there was lots of pieces that I cut off and threw away, or put you know put in the burn barrel. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you, you just don't know, especially walnut. You know, you can find a great piece of walnut at the uh, lumber yard, and you bring it back, and it's got sapwood where you didn't think you were going to get sapwood, and it's got mm -hmm. defects where you weren't expecting it. Yeah, you think the heartwood so. goes all the way through, and you look at the other side, and you realize, no, the, the whole back side of this thing is, is sapwood. 50% waste. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Slice of Wood has a question. He says, when you guys use knots that need to be filled in, would you stain before or after? I'd, I, I, I'd say, I, I don't know if I would stain the, stain the epoxy, but um, 
I'd probably no. do it after. I'd probably put on my top coat after, but I, I would just not stain in there at all. No, that's a great case where you'd want to use some kind of glaze. Um, yeah. You wouldn't want to stain it because it's going to absorb stain very differently than the rest of the material. So I would seal it and then maybe put a glaze over it to try to even out the, the finish so you don't see it as much. Or tint the epoxy so that you don't don't need to try and stain the epoxy to match. Yeah, but that's hard to, that's that's hard to figure out exactly how the epoxy could turn out. Or, or you could just not stain it. Yeah. I like the color of wood. I'm not a fan of stains or gel stains. or. Uh, I, when people want a dark piece, I say let's choose dark wood. Yeah. Uh, um, I have used um, dyes uh, before. I love the general finishes water-based dye stain. It sprays very, very well, but it usually sprays a lot darker than you think it's going to go on because when you spray, you usually don't wipe it off. But um, it's great. It's really good stuff. Um, yeah, what about, um, you guys ever had to deal with defects in hardware? What's that? You ever had to deal with defects in hardware? I, I just actually did a project where, I wouldn't say this is a defect, but um, think of sort of a, this was a, a display box for a piece of jewelry, and so it had sort of a slant front to it. Right. And I used uh, box hinges that are designed for a 90 degree um, you know, opening, and I needed basically 110 degrees. So if I opened this thing, and the hinges hit their normal stop, the the lid of this box would be at exactly perpendicular, and so it'd be really easy for the thing to slam down. It was you know had a glass right. panel, and it would have been bad. So I actually had to modify the hinge, and I used a Dremel with a, a diamond tip bit on it to actually like shave off the stops in the, the hinge. So I finally got the thing, I guess a 90 degree stop hinge typically opens to 110 degrees. I had it open to 115 or 120. Okay. So it wasn't, I, I wouldn't say it's a defect because I just don't make hinges to do what I needed hinges, these hinges to do, but um, it was still an opportunity to sort of modify the hardware to meet the needs yeah. of what I needed the project to do. Yeah. Have you ever done the aging of hardware? I've the uh, that that um, wine secretary that you saw. I antiqued the the brass on that. Okay. It was actually a pretty easy process, and you can you can somewhat reverse it as well. So you can sort of, you know, sand it back down and and really fine tune it. It was a much easier process than I expected. I don't I don't really do period reproductions. That was the only piece I've ever done that. I tried to sort of mimic some characteristics of an antique okay. piece of furniture. And is that is that process just basically using a solvent to take anything off and then uh, putting it in like a, a vinegar solution or? Yeah, there was a, I forget what the the brand name is, but there's a, an antiquing solution you can get at uh, Woodcraft or Rockler. And the only trick is you you have to buy solid brass. You can't get brass plated. Right, because that does have a film finish on it. It's also just a plating, so you could, you know, theoretically eat through it. Um, so you know that that costs a little bit more because you have to buy, you know, the the solid brass hardware. But in the end, you know, it, it it's um it's kind of a cool effect. Yeah. Here's a um. Here is a mallet, um, from Brian BC Craftmaster. Hold on, it's trying to not let me share the, share the window put a knot in the handle, which I think is probably a little bit risky, because um, you might be swinging this mallet and have this thing come apart, but it kind of looks cool. I was watching uh, was it Matthias Wandel on YouTube was making a, um, a shed, and he was bending some steel using his mallet, and he busted his mallet, so <laughs> I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't I don't know if it's a throwaway mallet, maybe, but I would definitely not recommend people put wood defects in tool handles. I've got a photo up of uh, one of Dale's pieces where he's left a quote-unquote defect in, and it's a worm, wormwood uh, tunnel, wormhole tunnel. It's a wormhole. If you fly through it, you go to a parallel universe. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, think that, I think that actually looks pretty cool. Yeah, I think so, too. I don't think that's going to cause any structural 
structural problems. So. No. Not yeah, at, at all. the end of the day, it, it's a mallet. You know. At the end of the day, it's a mallet. Yeah. <laughs> like kind of fret, you know, fretting over whether or not uh, it makes a lot of sense to get upset over a workbench error. You know, or a couple of tweaks here and there. You know, it's a workbench. So, what about uh, finishing screw-ups? I've had my share of finishing screw-ups. Rob is shaking his head like he's experiencing pain, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you want to share your pain with the group, Rob? You have to say, hi, my name's Rob. I'm a finishaholic. <laughs> I like to heat my linseed oil before I drink it. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm one of those guys that I typically like to keep my finishes fairly simple. You know, yeah. I'm... I'm sort of known for my oil and wax finishes. Um, I, I built a table for um, uh, just for a display not too long ago. I built it out of uh, ash. And I also have a problem where I always sand to too high a grit. So for this table, I think I sanded this ash to like 400 grit or so. Yeah. And I don't like... A festival like festival patine pad? It w yeah, I mean it was it was yeah I used I used my Festool sanders for the whole thing. Wait, you sanded the 400 before you started applying the finish? Yeah. Oh, that's just crazy, which, Peter. Which means he's burnished the top and the no no finish is going to go in. Oh yeah, it looked awesome before I started finishing. Um, but the reason for that is that I used this thing as a display piece at a show unfinished. So I just wanted it to have, like, you know, without any finish on it, I wanted to sand it as much as I could. Right. So when I got it back, I figured, well, i got to do something with this table, so I'll see if I can make it look like walnut, you know, ash to walnut. How hard can that be, right? Stupid. So I put, um, I think I sealed the pores, and then... Um, I put a couple coats of trans tint. I tried to get something that would look sort of like a walnut. Um, and then I wanted to put a sealer coat on it. And then I wanted to do a glaze on top of that. I wanted to spray the glaze because it was, um, you know, with, with ash, you really get the variation in the, uh, in the grain. And I wanted it to be much more sort of uniform. So I sealed it with shellac. And again, it was like, I think because I had sanded this to 400 grit, when I sprayed the uh, um, the, the coat of, of trans tint on top of that, it kept beating up. I couldn't get it to lay evenly. <laughs> did, you, did you mix it with alcohol or? It was alcohol. I tried it with water and alcohol. Um, and in both cases that glaze would just beat up on me. So it's kind of like now this weird like tiger stripe finish on the top. Yeah. The legs turned out okay. The legs didn't beat up quite as much. Um, but short of actually sanding it back down and then probably bringing it back to like 220 grit, um, the whole tabletop is, is either going to be sort of funky art deco or ruined. <laughs> and I haven't decided which yet. Have so you haven't actually... Uh, Finish the thing. No, I mean it's still or in. Or finish the thing. Yeah, I couldn't even. Do, you know, it's not for a customer. It's not for any. You know, practical use. It was just kind of like doing something with a, a display piece. And um, have you yeah. shared it at all on your blog? No, I haven't. I'll have to do that and maybe sort of uh, crowdsource the uh, the right solution the to right it. The right solution, yeah. Honestly, the the women I've showed it to think it looks really cool. And like any one of you sitting right here would go, oh man, that's a total disaster. <laughs> They're like, wow, that looks really funky. I dig it. So <laughs> I might just leave it as it is. I don't know. Well, one of the uh, I had a bike that a buddy of mine uh, was a, a car guy, and, and so he painted a bike for me, and um, it had a, a like canary yellow uh, uh, undercoat, and then he just uh, put on these huge fans. And started throwing black paint in the air. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> at the at the thing. It looked awesome. I mean, and and it was uh, you know sometimes uh, you know just throw stuff at, at things. I mean, if you're gonna go with the paint and stuff, I mean, but I, I, I gotta give you a hard time about the fact that you know you're taking taking a, a ash. You're trying to make it all look uniform like walnut. And I'm like, dude, you use way too much kiln dried walnut. Because <laughs> uh, kiln dry walnut, that's the problem with it. Is for me is that uh, the reason why I like uh, the the uh, uh, the sapwood 
is the same reason that I like like air dried walnut because there's so much contrast inside of uh, even the the heart uh, wood in walnut because it's just you know undulates with different tones all throughout it and and when it's kiln dried it tends to look more muddy to me. Yeah, you don't get the contrast steamed. Yeah, yeah so. when it's steamed. But you know. But I've seen your stuff, and I, I know how it is. I mean, I was hoping you were going to say you made a mistake on the sexy leg table or something. And it's like, that's how the, that's how the legs turn out like that, because <laughs> those are awesome. But, you know. Yeah, I love, I love incorporating sapwood in. I never, I never really consider sapwood a mistake. And, I mean, not like in the middle of a table necessarily, but, you know, if you can figure out a way to make it look uniform, then I think it's a nice, a nice accent when you can get those nice contrasts. Mm -hmm. Well, that is key. I mean, you have to... It has, it has to, to look like you did it on purpose. It can't be right. kind of like just a weird, you know, streak of sapwood on a corner somewhere where it looks like yeah. you're just trying to get a little more stock out of a you know, piece that you had. I'm but I think get... that's key with, with uh, any, with any board is in terms of figure and stuff like that. You know, if you're, if you're doing like a tabletop, well, you know, I, I've seen how you pour over... Uh, you know, when you're doing a piece and you're 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 trying to match, you figure out well, am I going to slip match it, book match it, you know, and you're you're playing with your boards and stuff. And, and it's like when I did Gretchen's Cradle, I threw half the lumber away because I ended up uh, um, wanting the wood to land in a certain spot, you know, the figure to land in a certain spot, so it would look more like snow coming up off the shoulder of the the sled. Um, and so. I, Sapwood and Sapele. I made this little keyboard tray here. I don't know if you can tell, but there's like this bottom strip right there. Yeah, that looks cool. That's all integrated into the keyboard tray itself. Now, I think um, whether you're going to incorporate sapwood or a knot or, or whatever, it, it, like Rob said, it can't just be like you ran out of material and you have sapwood on the corner. <laughs> it, ha it has to be intentional, and um, there was a comment from BC Craftmaster about if you can book match it where it looks like it was, it's a design element. If, if it just looks like you went out and bought a bunch of pine and put it up in your barbecue restaurant, then that just looks just like you used, you didn't select the wood, you didn't design it, you just put up what, put up paneling. But um, if you if you do it right, I think it can look like you you can you can like whether it's cathedral flames or um, I've seen grain where when you book match it it might look you know give lift to the piece like, mm -hmm. like wings or air but so speaking of finishing mistakes I have a I have one that was very painful to my fingertips um, I was building six or eight uh, they were just little cubes with bases they were trophy bases for the US Fencing Association and along the um, top of the cube, um, there was an OG, and along the base, there was an OG. And um, it was a, my first time using Endurovar, and because uh, I, I knew these things were going to be thrown in the trunks of cars. They, these weren't trophies that were going to be in a case. They were going to be handed out, and people were going to you know, drag them around. And um, so I wanted to use a really tough finish like Endurovar. So... Endurovar does this um, cross-linking. It's a water-based, waterborne finish that does cross-linking, and it cures very fast, and it it um, it uses up a lot of air. And what I found was on the end grain, it would actually pull the air out of the grain, and it created underneath the finish millions of tiny bubbles as it depleted the wood of its air. And so I had to hand sand in those OGs, um, there was four edges per trophy base down to the bare wood, and um, I just ended up sealing it with um, a spray lacquer of the same sheen, but I ended up doing that twice. 
because the first fix, I didn't seal the wood enough, and the Endurovar pulled, I, I think I used shellac, and the Endurovar pulled all these bubbles through the grain, oh. um, and my God, was it frustrating, because when, when you would spray the finish, it looks good, but as Endurovar does its chemistry magic and pulls all that air out, it just looked, it looked like there were little tiny pieces of silver glitter under the finish, <laughs> just on the edge grain, and it looked so bad, and uh, I had my buddy in town, and I was like, hey, man, here's some sandpaper. Let's get out there, and it was, that definitely increased the cost of that project, my cost, but not my billable cost on that project. That, that really sucked. That's why I stay away from spray finishes. I'm, I'm with Rob on just the oil and wax. I mean, it's. I mean, unless you like in Rob's case, you burnish the the wood surface <laughs> before you apply it. It's really hard to mess up an oil and wax finish. Hey, Andy, I'm going to put your sapwood desk in the screen share here because I think your use is that a live edge on there as well. Yeah, this is some this is some pretty kick-ass stuff. And I'll tell you, if anyone is going to be coming to woodworking in America. Uh, in Cincinnati and is interested in getting some pretty nice pieces. This is this is Macare. Um I don't know if you can zoom in on it. I posted a link. It's easier to see that way. But the edge, it's kind of tough to see, but the edge basically has all these convolutions and, and kind of pillow folds in it that occurred naturally where the bark would kind of connect in on the Macare tree, and this is all solid. I mean, this was from one giant 17-foot-long slab of, of Macare, and there's just one glue joint down the middle of it, so then I used kind of opposite ends on each side of the table. I used the sapwood. have a live edge on both edges? Yeah, it's basically, because basically you, you could cut, it's, it's, it's in the middle of the table, where the glue joint is. So just on the edge, that's where the two pieces were connected. So it's it's four feet wide, um, and it's it's just a beautiful, beautiful wood. It basically kind of has that modeled, that block model or beehive kind of figure to it. Right, okay. And the, the sapwood was just too cool. I mean, the live edge just had some amazing things. I'm, I'm sitting at the desk right now, and I just, I, it's just always nice to kind of touch and feel it, and it just kept the natural characteristics of the wood. So That's, that's cool. Yeah. It's, it's a very high silica content wood. Mm. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of resharpening of tools and, and cleaning up that live edge was, was no easy task, but it was, it was worth it. What did you use to clean that live edge up? Uh, some round rasps, um, some some gouges just to kind of clean up the, the 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 basic chunks. There were a few sections that had some splits in it that I basically recut and rebuilt to look like the rest of the the little pillow fold effect. But ninety percent of it was was all naturally occurring. And then I used those those um, the sanding wheels that have like the fingers, the abrasive fingers on them, mm. um, and those work pretty well in 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 this kind of a situation. So I'd love an excuse to make another piece out of this wood, but uh, you know, yeah. I, I just need to find a project to do it. Hey, Vic, for the record, that wasn't stripper glitter. <laughs> 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 and no, it didn't smell like cotton candy <laughs> or or armpit. Um, Ooh. Yeah. So, so talking about spraying. So, um, so here's kind of my here's kind of the way I've been finishing uh, all of my large projects lately. If, if it's a smaller project, I I just do things by hand, and I do a lot of the uh, wiping varnish. But uh, if I'm going to use a dye, I'll, I'll sand. But and if I'm going to use a dye, I'll spray my dye. You use, usually use the general finishes water waterborne because um, you can tint it, you can dilute it, you can mix it, you can make up whatever color you want. Um, and then I go crazy with shellac and I spray um, de-wax shellac. That goes over the dye really well and it doesn't. Um, I found you know if, if you if you put down a dye and then you try and wipe the shellac, you just end up picking up the dye a lot of the times and, and moving it around, making mud. Um, and then 
I'll do one coat of Enduro Bar on top of the shellac, and that has been the reason I like it is because everything I'm using dries really fast. So I don't need to take I don't need to spread my finishing out over over five days. Um, and the, sh the the problem is that for some reason all the stores around me nobody wants to carry seal coat anymore. Um, so I'm just going to start making my own um, super blonde de wax shellac or might even get into some of the other colors, but um, and I have that HVLP gun, and for big pieces, man, that's that is money. It's been working well for me. So just out of curiosity, what has sent you? Uh, um, or, or what was the reason why you do so much uh, staining? Um, I had one guy who wanted a tabletop for a computer desk, and he wanted it to be cherry. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you don't know what cherry looks like. Um, and when he said cherry, he meant that purpley, deep red port wine cherry that um, people say is cherry furniture. Nasty. Um, when, I sh yeah, when I showed him cherry, he goes, oh, that's cherry? That just looks like wood. I go, well, cherry, <laughs> cherry is wood. Um, but he wanted news that Newsflash. <laughs> yeah, newsflash. Uh, but he wanted that color, so um, <laughs> so uh, I got the general finishes dye, and and I made um, a birch cabinet grade plywood look look like cherry. And then the other one uh, that I most recently dyed um, was the bar that I refinished, um, the crescent bar bar that I obviously still haven't blogged about. Um, and Brian says I'm cheating for spraying. Thanks, Brian. Um, and we needed that to match some existing furniture that we had, um, and so I used the dye. I used the dye to do that, um, and it worked out worked out really well. So, yeah, a lot of times you you need to try to make one material look like another material for whether it's durability reasons or I've I've gotten pretty good at making maple look a lot like mahogany. And uh, yeah, I saw it's, that video. It's you all did. with dyes. Yeah. And, I've and that's not easy wood to dye either. It's so dense. Yeah. That would make me cry, making maple look like mahogany. <laughs> I, I'd be like, I don't want to do it. You can't make me do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got paid well enough that it didn't make me cry. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess that's uh, I guess that's the upside of not being a professional, is you know, um, I just do do what I want to do. So. Same here. Yeah, hey, uh, Andy, I use the Erlex. You do? Yeah, I have the 6900, which is basically the 7000 with a shorter hose. Yeah. And um, probably the worst thing about it is the is the handle on the gun is uncomfortable to hold. Oh, okay. But um, works well. I have all the different tips. And, um, you know, I'm getting better at it. I built a spray booth, and um, uh, when I sprayed the mantles, I did have some drips, but they were super easy. I I paired them off with a chisel mm -hmm. uh, to remove the bulk of the drip and um, just sanded it down so it was smooth without going all the way through the through the finish. And then I just spot sprayed those areas and just perfect, absolutely perfect. So yeah, you know I got spray paint. paint with that too. Yeah, that's what I heard. I mean, you can spray paint with those things or, you know, all, all sorts of different finishes. I had a uh, friend of mine who just made an entire kitchen of um, solid cherry cabinetry just from scratch, and he sprayed all the all the wood. And he, he's one of those savants that basically can take on any project and do it really well. He had never built cabinetry before and never used a spray finish. Yeah, and then the and, next weekend he rebuilt his uh, Corvette's tran transmission. He's an engineer. He's an engineer at GE. He's an aircraft engineer at GE. Okay. And uh, you're not supposed to be able to put boxes together. Oh my God! It's unbelievable. The, the quality, of the finish was amazing. I just, I, I was jealous. But it's, it's an investment of space and time and effort and you know. Yeah. Like I said before, oil and wax seems to. It's, it's easy to fix too. That's the yeah. Thing. When I did um the little table that Vic was mentioning earlier called Hayden's table, that was all. Um, Danish oil, hand applied, wet sanded. Mm -hmm. I even created the slurry on the top to fill the pores. Oh yeah. Had to do the end grain at a higher grit. 
Yep. And then uh, when the when the oil dried, I did um, like five coats of a wipe-on oil varnish blend, mostly on the top, um, not so much on the legs and the apron, and beautiful, really, really beautiful. But I want to try um, the warm oil that Rob does. Um, and my theory was that you could get one of those bottle warmers for baby bottles. Because mm-hmm. I keep all my finish in these uh, plastic bottles with little spouts and caps, kind of like glue bottles. Yeah. Just wrap that sucker around there, get your finish warm, and don't have to worry about a, a bath or whatever. Oh, Todd Montana's here. Mosher, oh. Thomas, Thomas Mosher does the warm oil application yeah. as well. Yeah, it's in his book. I think yeah. Rob actually recommended that book for me, too. It's a good book. So, guys, yeah, we are past 7 o'clock. We can keep going if you want, or we can decide to wrap it up. So I, got, uh, I got a wife asking for my computer here, so I gotta, I'm going to check out here, guys. Okay. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to join you guys. Thanks again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for stopping Thanks, by. Thank you, Andy. Likewise. See you guys. Take care. Yeah, I just uh, uh, asked uh, Todd to uh, link to his uh, spray uh, system. He's got a really awesome the pressure pot setup. Yeah, um, that's really what I'm looking at. Uh, either I'm either going to go that direction or with the Fuji system. So uh, Fuji, um, probably like a QX4. Somewhere in there, yeah. Don't I want something that. with metal parts, all metal parts. Yeah. You know, because I'm not going to beat the hell out of it, but at the same time, I'm I'm hopefully going to use it for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, now that I know that I like the HVLP, when, when the Erlex dies, I'll I'll definitely look into getting a better one or, or a pressure pot or a, con- or a conversion gun. Uh, Neil Lehman's nephew lives out by me, and he stops by the shop sometimes, and... Uh, he was looking into a conversion gun, so I told him to look into the pressure pots as well, especially he's spraying tinted lacquer, mm-hmm. and uh, the advantage is you can just leave it in the gun. You don't have to clean it out, and then um, just come back and spray again, and you know, every once in a while you have to open the pressure pot and put in a new gallon can, and that's about it. So, Well, folks, you want to wrap it up here? Yeah, I'm going to go say goodbye to the... Uh or say hello to the wife, and then uh, we're, we're dropping off uh, the mother-in-law tomorrow up in Seattle. We'll be in your neck of the woods there. Um, and I'm going to be leaving tomorrow to go to your neck of the woods. <clears throat> well, that's okay. I'm, I'm just doing a trip across and back. Okay. So. All right, folks. Well, that was Wood Chat for June 27th. want to thank uh, Andy, Vic, and Rob for joining us. Um, just a reminder that we're canceling for July 4th because it's Independence Day here in the States, and people will be eating barbecue and blowing stuff up. Uh, remember that the links to all the WoodChat resources are on UppercutWoodworks.com. Just check the WoodChat menu. There's a link to the Google Plus page, uh, the transcripts, the chat room, and the videos. And uh, the video will be posted on YouTube here as soon as uh, we hit end broadcast. It takes about five minutes uh, for Google to do that. And on July 11th, we're going to be talking with um, Andy and maybe some folks from Gorilla Glue. Hopefully they'll have some giveaways for us. Um, about uh, adhesives and some of the product ideas you guys came up with last time. And then coming um, later in July, um, Matt Vanderlist is going to join us for a wood chat. Um, on a separate Wednesday, Mark Spagnolo is going to join us. And on a separate Wednesday, um, Shannon Rogers is going to join us. So we're going to individually be able to um, attack all of the uh, wood talk online guys. So, um, so that'll be fun. Um, it might be fun to get them to talk about some of the mistakes that they've made in the past and how they've fixed them. So thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.